Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, esotericism, mysticism, the Cathars, the tarot, hidden codes, secret knowledge, lost knowledge, forbidden knowledge, recovered knowledge. Uh, my name is Deacon Jonathan Stord. I'm joined by one of our many uh, co-hosts, uh, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello there. Thanks for having me here on this show again, John. Yeah, really excited to, to have you here. Glad that you could make it sort of last moment, but uh, always, always a pleasure. Uh, and I'm actually glad um, our, our topic tonight is uh, the Cathars and Tarot, and our guest is Russell Sturgis. Hello, Russell. Hi, nice to be here. Really, real pleasure to, to have you on. Your book is uh, really intriguing, and I think it's, uh, of course, we're going to talk about it. Uh, I think it's something that is uh, paradigm changing in a lot of ways, and a lot of people out there watching and listening are going to be uh, fascinated by it. Um, I was actually, uh, before, in before introducing you, before I got into my rant with Jason about Jason and him coming on sort of last moment, uh, I actually really love having uh, Jason on. He, he does have, you know, a background in esotericism. He has a strong interest in it he loves the tarot but i'm glad that he didn't read your book or that we were able to throw him in at the last moment because he always has such great questions on the spot so it's, it's as much as we can keep him in the dark i'm not even gonna say what the topic is next time jason um i have i have heard of the book i don't want to make it sound like i'm just completely unaware <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we are chopping at the bit to get into this uh the spectacular uh topic but unfortunately and i hate doing this and you can tell that i hate doing it i always say that i hate doing it but we have to do a little bit of housekeeping at the beginning of the show which is our commercial for our patreon we are brought to you by viewers and listeners like you uh we literally can't do the show without your financial support so if you are able to help us out financially, just go to patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can help us out. You can also put a cap on that. So if we release a lot of pieces of media in the month, you're not going to get overwhelmed. You can stay within your budget. Uh, if you want to do a one-time donation, you don't want to sign up for the recurring Patreon, go to paypal.com slash Gnostic. You can do that there. Uh, if you are unable to help us out financially, we completely understand. I'm often in that position myself, and these are particularly trying times. However, you can also help us out a lot. It's actually a really big help to just tell people about the show. You know, mouse to ear, it's worked for thousands of years, it still works today. You can also post a show on your social media, you can send it to friends or family, you can take your favorite episode and email it to somebody, you can like and subscribe uh, on our YouTube, you can leave us reviews on the podcatcher of your choice, particularly Apple Podcasts, uh, what was formerly iTunes right now. You know, we don't got that many reviews and they're not that great, so I'm going to chalk that up to Archons, uh, but particularly with Apple podcast uh, reviews really help us uh, get into the listings there so the commercial is over and we have our guest russell here's the good stuff uh russell i know that this this could be a a, a 40 hour mini series this one question and i often lampshade this because we often expect our guests to do the wonderful magic of trying to sum up an incredibly deep talk a topic so i apologize for this but who were the cathars and what do they have to do with the ancient gnostics Okay, so the Cathars were a Gnostic Christian sect that existed in primarily um, or most strongly in southern France from sort of the end of the 12th century and uh, were essentially wiped out by the Catholic Church by the time we get to the middle of the 14th century. Um, so um, their, their, their Gnostic bent um, was certainly very strongly aligned with the Bogomils who were... Um, once again, Gnostic Christians that emerged out of Bulgaria and out of the Eastern States and made their way through um, and sort of turned up in um, um, Western Europe, um, Constantinople primarily, and then eventually made their way through into the, 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 the rest of Western Europe. The Cathars as such first emerged in Cologne um, in Germany um, around the middle of the 12th century. And that's when they were first discovered. And it seems that, that they had been functioning primarily as a, a hidden sect 
um, up until that time. And then we start to see them spreading through um, primarily the Languedoc region um, of southern France, and they became incredibly well established um, at that particular point. So they sort of, their, their Gnostic um, tenants were um, this, this whole idea of, of the, the, the dual world, dualism, the, the, the idea that there was um, a, a kingdom of the good God and the kingdom of the evil God. And so they sort of subscribed to this notion. They were reincarnationists um, and um, they, they felt that Jesus was primarily um, more of a um, a way shower than he was a saviour. They certainly didn't su subscribe to him as a saviour in any way. Um, and um, yet where they probably strongly differed to uh, Gnosticism is that, you know, the idea of, as I understand it, and, and please excuse me, I don't see myself as an expert in Gnosticism, but um, what I understand is that, that within the Gnostic um, tradition, it's Gnosis that basically is responsible for saving you, if I can use it that way. Yeah. Whereas the, the Cathar had taken more of a sort of a Christian approach and it was their perfecti or their priests that were the keys to saving you. And so they had sort of moved away essentially from that core Gnostic notion to taking on this idea that, that, that it was these emissaries of God, these were the closest things to God on earth primarily were these perfecti and they were the ones that were capable of making it possible for you to find your way into heaven. That's probably the simplest way to describe it. Yeah. Um, what did they have to do with the tarot, with tarot cards? And how did you discover this connection and, and break the Cathar code? Okay, that's a big question too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so as the the Cathars were pretty well by twelve forty four, twelve forty five, they had been wiped out of of um, the Languedoc region of southern France. So the the Albigensian Crusade had been commissioned in twelve oh nine by Pope Innocent the Third, and they systematically went through and exterminated as many of the Cathars as they could and their religion. So it wasn't just the people they were getting rid of their knowledge and their teachings and and the, the perfecto were intelligentsia there's a lot of records of them debating with the dominicans for example and they would they would have these intellectual debates to try and win um the the laurel you know the sort of to 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 get the award for having converted the most people um and so there was a the the perfecto were intelligentsia and uh and and we there's the famous story of Montsegur, and that was basically the last stand of the Cathars um, in southern France. Um, so there is a resurgence um, for a few years until sort of around about oh, the, maybe the first decade, around about 1311, up in the Pyrenees. There were a couple of brothers who sort of reconnected with it and and sort of connected with the Cathar. Um, um, religion, um, but they were once again um, they were got rid of by by certainly by about a thirteen eleven they were gone. So what happened was, of course, the Cathars had become established in in northern Italy as well, and um, at this particular time, around this time, the Visconti who were in control of Milan had been excommunicated. Um, by the church, the Milan region, and um, and they had a particular affinity for heretics, it would seem, and and so any of the people that that survived in that Languedoc region um, certainly made their way across into this area of north and central Italy, and um, and and found. Um, a, a place where that they could live and practice what it is that they believed in, and and so. But even then, uh, the Inquisition had taken over and between, and that started somewhere around about 1233. And by the time we get to 1350, the last of the, the known Cathar priests and much of the Cathar church had certainly been uh, eliminated even in Northern Italy. And, um, and it makes no surprise that it became an underground religion. Um, and it started out as that, as a hidden religion. And certainly that's where it ended up. Now, the interesting thing that happened is that playing cards entered Western Europe around this same time. And, um, 
I make the assertion that in an attempt to salvage their core teachings, this knowledge was translated from manuscripts um, into playing cards. And um, having listened to some of your earlier interviews um, where you talk about how art was a, an intrinsic part of Gnosis um, and Gnosticism, um, it, it's no surprise that this medium of art on these small cards that you carried um, became a way for, for being able to uh, salvage the, the, the core teachings of this religion. Right. They, they would have originally been um, held in manuscripts. You know, there's a great story about Montsegur where the night before they eventually give themselves over to um, um, their captors, um, four of the perfecti supposedly had uh, escaped from the mountain with their treasure and people have sort of been in search of their treasure. Well, you know, um, money wouldn't have been part of, or, or, or anything to do with material wealth would not have been part of Cathar treasure because they did not subscribe to the material world because that was the world of the evil God. And so we know it would have had to have been their deep teachings. And of course, there's a, there's a, there's a lovely tradition that says that they possess the Holy Grail. And based on, on what I talk about in my book, I propose the notion that the Holy Grail was knowledge and and that what what was being secreted out of Montesquieu was probably manuscripts or what they went and collected supposedly in the forest would have been hidden manuscripts and that these probably made their way into um, northern Italy and um, uh, and and that eventually um, they were transcribed into these portable what I call stained glass windows so I think that they became a really wonderful, simple tool for people who were living in, in um, secrecy, who were hidden, to be able to um, hold this knowledge and these teachings um, in these picture cards. And, and in particular, the ones that we're talking about here are the 22 cards of the Major Arcana. And so we see the Visconti having these cards being commissioned um, and, um, and then um, they, they, they they're used as playing cards. They eventually join the the, the regular sets of of, of playing cards. Um, some say that to avoid paying two lots of entertainment tax, because back in those days, if you were going to play cards, you had to have your ace of spades had to be franked to show that you had paid tax. And so there's a really lovely story, who knows if it's true, but there's a lovely story that, that they end up um, um, joining the cards together to avoid paying two lots of entertainment tax. And so we end up with this set of cards, um, which is this concept of trumps or triumphi. And eventually they became known as the Taroki and, and the Tarot. And, and they, they leave Northern Italy essentially and, and re-emerge in, in France during the 1600s. And we have a canonized version of these images now. Up until then, they were quite um, reactive to what was happening politically um, and socially. And so they, they could change the, the, the theme on the cards, but time, by the time we get into the 1600s in, in Paris and, and in, in um, France, we see a canonized version of these images that later become referred to as the Marseille Tarot. Both hide the teachings in a you know, common container, right? No one would suspect gambling cards. Uh, and as you said, um, they're stained glass windows because a lot of people would not have been able to read, right? So if you're talking about teaching people, preserving the teachings, uh, and then as well as, you know, if you're kind of illustrating these principles to people who can't read. Is that right? Yeah, look, um, you mean, if you look in modern day, we, we use comic books to um, entertain our children. Yeah. You know, and essentially these were comic books. These were the equivalent to a tool for people who were, you know, when you look at, the, there, were, there were three levels within the, um, um, the Cathars. There were the Perfecti, who were the intelligentsia, and these were the priests. And then you had the, the believers who had been baptised and were committed, but still lived pretty sort of normal lives. They weren't austere. And then you had listeners who sort of didn't want to go all the way and probably were scared crapless with the church and what the church was doing. 
um, and and so um, to reach the the believers and the listeners, they had to have um, a way of communicating with them. And these portable stained glass windows were a perfect way of being able to house this knowledge. But that being said, as my book explains, the symbolism that's housed within these cartoons is is incredibly profound. And and there's a deep mystery there. It's it's more than just sort of um, a lot of pretty pictures. There, you know, there, there's a deep mystery. Yeah. Well, that leads in quite well to my next question, which is we're talking about preserving uh, persecuted knowledge. And and by the way, you know, for for those who haven't read the book, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Kafars, when we say persecution, it, it was extremely violent, like almost genocidal, right? We're talking thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, killed, possibly. Was it at, at Bezier? Was it something like 20,000, possibly, uh, Russell? Just, you know, just, just blood uh, that we can't really conceive of in the modern age, uh, mostly committed, uh, you know, against by their fellow country people, right? Yep. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so very brutal. But um, uh, so, so, so we're trying to preserve this persecuted wisdom. But if you say tarot, the first thing I think about is fortune telling. Like, isn't that what tarot cards are for? Well, and and certainly that's that's um, what most people see um, tarot being um, used for certainly today. And interestingly enough, the that 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 fortune telling role of tarot cards uh, literally didn't um, take place until we get into the uh, probably, I was going to say the late 17th century, but probably more the early 18th century. So the the um, we see in the 1700s the cards starting to be used more systematically for for doing readings, and this became a very popular thing in France around this time, and certainly became much more popular by the time we get into the 1800s. But up until then, um, the for the majority of the the the, the, the population, tarot cards were a game, and were being used for 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 playing um, um, gambling games and, and entertainment. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I got to live in Italy um, in 2007 while I was researching um, a whole lot of the foundations of this book. And I lived in a little mountain village halfway between Rome and Naples. And each evening you'd, you'd, you'd go past the, 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 the bar or the cafe and he would be the men playing cards. I mean, it's, it's an intrinsic part of the tradition um, in Italy, the, the card playing. Um, uh, interestingly enough, um, cards replaced dice. So uh, prior to um, cards being used, dice were being used for games and for, um, to some extent, divining purposes as well. Yeah. Um, before I, I keep uh, trudging through, going through, <laughs> Rampaging through the question sheet, uh, I'll take a breath and just check in. Uh, Jason, do you have uh, uh, the questions, comments, uh, anything that you would you want to build on from what Russell's saying? Well, I, I think it's not fair that uh, that you already addressed comics because that was what I was going to lead in with. But uh, so, <laughs> um, but no, I think uh, I think that's a fascinating uh, um, uh, comparison because I think uh, there's been a lot of a lot of. Uh, uh, comic writers and even esoteric esoteric comic writers like Alan Moore, who've really made the point that words and pictures together uh, can often have a more potent um, impact than than either on their own. Um, uh, but to leave that hanging for a bit and maybe focus more on the on the card game quality to it, I guess maybe a question I've got or a speculation I'd love to hear you wor uh, work on is: um, so we've got these we've got this group that's that's uh, instilling an um, uh, sort of a both both aesthetic and spiritual goal with these cards, um, but then it also just turns into like the a daily daily uh, um, pastime. Uh, is there like is, is there some sort of permeable influence that's happening because of that at all? Like, is there is is there any kind of cultural impact that's happening because these cards have this like sort of latent quality to them? Um, probably not um, in an extended way. No. Um, but but certainly within the um, um, co-fraternities mm -hmm. that would have subscribed to those core teachings, I, I think that um, it, it was obviously having its impact. Um, but I think it was too well hidden. 
um, in sight, in plain sight, um, and and there, you know, the, so people couldn't see as as a cultural, you know, sort of across the board, they they just couldn't be seen for their deeper meaning. I don't believe. Um, I think that that, um, um, and that was seen in the way in which the images changed based on, you know, when when the um, French Revolution happened, the emperor and the empress were placed with grandfather and grandmother. You know, right. and and so what we see is is that its deep spiritual meaning could be easily um, tr translated into whatever was happening within the society, and mm -hmm. so I think that they were more plastic to what was going on within the culture, and not the other way around. I don't think it, it was having any deep impact on the culture per se um, from its deep spiritual context. Ah, great! I, that's actually really interesting. The, the the symbols changing to reflect the times. Yeah, and and depending on whether the um, emperor or the pope um, mm -hmm. was having more power at any particular mm -hmm. point depended on where he came in the sequence, you know, totally. in terms of relevancy of power, you know. Yeah. So, so it, it, they were really quite plastic to the to what was going on politically and socioeconomically um, mm -hmm. in terms of of what the images would contain in them from time to time. And as I said, it wasn't until um, we, we get to um, sort of the 1600s that it sort of becomes canonized and, mm -hmm. and they no longer change the sequence of the cards. The cards have a sequence. There, there's a fairly standard, consistent um, symbolism within the images and, and it's now sort of deemed to be, you know, this, this teaching tool, um, mm -hmm. yeah, at that particular point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank um, you. Russell, uh, you you mentioned the Visconti in in passing. This this powerful <laughs> family in Milan. Can you talk about them and, and their connection to to the tarot and their connection to the Cafar's teachings? Look, I I there, there's so much written about this, and 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 I suspect that they were too um, busy involved in trying to um, protect um, their vested interests that spending too much time on these other things wasn't probably really high on their agenda other than the fact that um that they um didn't have they they were association they were associated with the um 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 the particular political group um that were associated that were linked with the emperor versus the pope so they weren't particularly um politically aligned with the pope and in fact um um, we end up with the um, um, Gebelines, um and just at the moment, the other group sort of uh, have slipped my memory. Um, but we've got these two political factions, and one's really strongly supportive of the emperor, and the other one's supportive of the pope. And interesting enough, Florence was very, very strongly at the Guelps. They were very strongly aligned with the Pope, and and here we have the Visconti, um, very strongly aligned with the emperor. And um, and so, eventually, because of of the the um, separation that happens between the emperor and the pope at this time, we see the the Visconti and Milan becoming marginalised by the pope, and and so um, you know, and so we have stories like um, a whole bunch of the the key political supporters of Matteo Visconti um, uh, are, are Cathar heretics. Um, there's a story that the Pope S card, for example, um, uh, is um, the, there was a religious sect that emerged um, in, 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 in this area of, of Milan, and they're about to appoint their own Pope S, who happens to be a cousin of Matteo Visconti. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't go ahead. She gets um, burnt at the stake and, um, you know, it, it sort of, once again, has to go underground to some extent, um, but but so so we've got this 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 region that um, really is allowing these heretics to survive, and um, and it's very evident that that they're constrained by how much protection they can give them because we still see um, the headquarters for the Inquisition was in Milan, um, and and ironically enough, the the Visconti Church um was sort of like the headquarters but and so we have this this sort of dual world happening uh, the politics would have been really intriguing in terms of how that worked out but um to to the extent that they could they were able to be housed with certainly without any sort of 
um, serious repercussions um, from the Visconti. In fact, it seems that they were supported in, in terms of being able to be there and, and, and practice their beliefs. And it, and, and it suggested that, that they actually filled some of the role of the, um, of the, the, the priests um, because they had sort of been excommunicated, they had stepped back. And so these heretics were able to provide some of the, the religious needs that were required within the community. Right. And, um, and the very... Now, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so one, one of the things that my book does is it actually looks at a whole lot of the symbolism in the cards and that it has a very specific link to what was going on during the time that the Visconti were actually in control of Milan. A lot of the, the um, um, history to the symbols that are being used, because this is a common language, you know, everyone understands this language because it's part of what they're living. And so they're able to use these to convey really important messages through, through, through picture form. But these pictures have a, a you know, a, a whole meaning to them in terms of what was going on in this region during this particular period. Yeah. And as far as we know, the, the very first tarot deck ever was made for the Visconti family, right? At least the first one that we have <laughs> that, yes. uh, it, physically. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and and so once again, you know, Jason, um, the 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 death card, um, for example, um, at this particular time shows um, a skeleton with a bow, and it was mm -hmm. a little bit like Eros in the sense that it was sort of like you don't know when the arrow was going to strike, and and but all of a sudden the the plague appears, and the death card now has. Um, in, in, in some of the, the later cards, when we sort of get to this period here, the, the death card now has um, a skeleton on a horse with the scythe, and in the scythe is 20 people, you know. So all of a sudden, death takes on a whole new meaning um, mm -hmm. based on the, 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 the Black Plague. And, and so we've got this, this whole transformation of the symbolism based on what was going on within the community. Mm -hmm. with with the changes in, in symbolism so you know our, our viewers our listeners they can go to the internet right now they can take a look at the visconti tarot cards are beautiful um but the the better known tarot deck and then sort of the basis for many modern decks is, is known as the tarot of marseille which seems to pop up in france a couple hundred years later and you talk a, a lot in your book about the symbolism uh, kind of found in the tarot of marseille was there was there secret cafars or uh, similar esoteric sex sort of guiding that imagery hundreds of years later or how, how do you uh, or it, should we just be looking at the the visconti tarot or uh uh how do you sort of deal with some of those those changes and those those stark differences between the two decks oh look I, it's one of the pieces of the the information that for me personally was missing and and it may actually well be there in french texts that haven't been translated um into um in into english but um but there's definitely a transition in the images you know so the world card for example in the visconti um you know has um the the city of jerusalem in the world card um which was in revelation symbolic of of you know the the sacred mother you know um as as in the in chapter 25 i think in revolution uh, in revelations talks about that and all of a sudden um 200 years later not all of a sudden the image goes from the city of jerusalem being in the center of this card to um a mandola um shape um yoni um, as the symbol of the sacred mother. And so the, the, the core intent of the card existed back in the Visconti time, but they take on a new set of um, interpretation, um, like even with the death card, you know, sort of the, the original Visconti is sort of the, the concept of, of death could happen. By the time we get to the Marseille Tarot, death has already taken place all the heads and the hands are in the ground and so there's a there's a new interpretation of the 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 message um in terms of what the cards cards trying to portray so there's a maturing um during that 200 year period which would suggest that there there were a group of people who were involved in continuing and these were the co-fraternities these were the secret societies um, um i talk about the the um 
the, the Sotties, and which were plays. And these were plays that took on the role um, of, of the fool and explaining the role of the fool and, and, and sort of alluding to some of these concepts. And they sort of took on a theatrical um, position. So, and these were, once again, these were co-fraternities, they were societies and some of them were secret societies. And so there's enough evidence to suggest that there, there was a continuation in terms of this knowledge in terms of co-fraternities. Right. So we're talking about this, the secret knowledge, this, this knowledge that people died for, that they risked their lives for, which was carried in a hidden way. But, you know, the, the world a thousand years ago was pretty different from the world we live in now. <laughs> and, you, you know, this all sounds great intellectually, cool history, but is it really relevant for, for today's world? Like, can people use the tarot and this lost knowledge of the Cathars to improve their, their 21st century lives? Absolutely. Um, in, in particular, the major arcana, because basically what, you know, what they were suggesting in these cards and, and this was what I was able to unlock, you know, uh, uh, the card number one is, is the magician and the magician wears a hat that's um, basically in the shape of a, a lemniscate or a, a lazy eight, if you want to call it that. And it was and there's a whole story behind this in terms of my own aha. And I can still remember the day in, in, in Italy when I had the aha about unlocking, because this is the key. Um, I call it the rose key that really unlocks the secret knowledge. And this unlocks how the cards to be delayed are to be laid out. This is the 22 picture cards. And cards one through 10 um, represent a left-hand sided um, arc um, half of an eight, and then the right hand side cards eleven through twenty represent the right hand, and this is the, this is the part of the concept of of this dual world. So the left hand side is the world of illusion; it's the world of the evil god, and the magician stands right at the front of this, and he says, "This is all an illusion. I'm an illusionist. I'm a magician for heaven's sake. It's all a trick." And then he identifies what the tricks are through the cards. And so even the concept of birth and reincarnation is an illusion. And, and so, you know, the, the, the Pope S is holding the book of life, which is sort of this idea that, that you're on this next part of your, your incarnation journey. And then you pass through the veil and the Empress is there and she gives birth to you, part of the illusion again. And then you have the Emperor who represents, at this point, he represents power. The church, particularly um, when we get up into the the, the um, time of the Visconti, um, so so we're now dealing um, with Clement V, for example. He was all about money. Everything that he was about was about wealth. And so all of a sudden the church doesn't represent spirituality. It now is a symbol for wealth at this particular time. Then we have the lovers and or love depending on what what era and we see these three figures here and these these represent this concept of eros which is romantic love and um, um and we've got um um you know um these different types of love that take us away from agape which is the ultimate divine love um and and then we move on to the chariot card which is about the victor about success all of these things are part of the illusion. The magician says, none of these things are real. And in fact, you'll get caught up in these things and they will keep you stuck in this, in this world. Um, and more to the point, if you buy into that, you're also going to buy into suffering because there's three cards that want to wake you up from that illusion. And then that's justice, um, which is about natural justice. Then you've got aging and the prospect of dying and getting old. And then you've got the wheel of fortune. You can have it all one minute and the next minute it's taken away from you. Anytime you buy into the illusion, those three cards will tie up, um, turn up and they will cause you to come to this place of, of, of suffering. And, um, and this is the crossroads where this lemnistate crosses over. And, and so the, the crossroads, then you can go one of four ways. You can keep on going um, clockwise and reinvest in the world of illusion. Um, and, and that's what we call, or used to call midlife crisis. 
people have several of those now where they keep on coming back and they get the sports car and the younger woman, and the, you know, and keep on reinvesting. But anytime you reinvest in the illusion, you will always invite justice, time and chance. You can't avoid them while you're in the world of illusion. Your other option is to smart time. You get to the point where you're in a plate of sustained suffering. And, and of course, we've dealt with that beautifully. We've created drugs for treating depression and we keep people in, you know, sort of in limbo with antidepressants. And, and then people invest in um, diversionary um, ways in which they spend their resources, time and money, et cetera, which is gambling and sex and, you know, whatever it is that they have as their addictions or avoidances. Um, the other option is, is going up towards the judgment card, which is suicide, um, taking the shortcut. Or the other one is to go into the dark night of the soul. And this is what the knowledge was that these guys had that still has relevancy for us today. What they were saying is that there is another alternative, but there's a billboard out the front of that journey and it's a woman, it's a refined woman holding open the mouth of the lion. And, and, and basically she's saying, you're going to have to have this sort of courage to go down this route. But if you go down this route, you can be free of the suffering that's that, and you can be free of the world of illusion. And, and so now the, the Cathar, um, the only prayer that they subscribe to and primarily the scriptures that they subscribe to was the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the first 17 chapters of John, I think that they subscribe to as well. And, um, and they aligned themselves with some of Revelations, but primarily for them, they felt that the core teachings of, of, of Christianity or Jesus um, was um, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and as much as they subscribed to the Lord's Prayer, the first core part of the Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes. And that's that series of statements that says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are those that mourn, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I go through and point out how the hanged man, for example, relates to blessed are the poor in spirit. So they basically were able to take these images. The, the, the death card is blessed are those that mourn. Temperance is blessed are those that are meek. You know, I, I love um, blessed are those that are hunger and thirst, who hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is passion for righteousness. Mm. They've got temptation. They've got the devil there representing mm. temptation. What a beautiful image to portray mm. this stuff. Now, they added in some other bits here that, that w which are really important to us today. That And this is knowledge that I think is missing in, in whether it's psychological tradition and, or even in the spiritual tradition, and that is the test of the, the, the flaming sword and the cherubim. How many times do you hear people go to church and hear sermons by the priest on how to pass the test of the cherubim and the flaming sword? Can't say I've heard one. <laughs> and you don't hear people talk about it, but when we think back to that story, Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden because they've now subscribed to differentiated consciousness, the idea that there's something that isn't God. And God said, well, you can't hang around here because your knowledge, which isn't wrong, because we have that knowledge, but our knowledge is love-based, yours is fear-based. So you can't hang around here. But in order to get back in here and be with us and, and experience the oneness that is love-centered, you have to pass two tests. And, and the two tests are the test of the flaming sword and the cherubim. And so here we see the devil holding a flaming sword, the devil card. And so all of a sudden, hang on, the Cathars have this deeper appreciation of this, this concept of these tests that were outside of the Eastern Gate, as it talks about. And of course, ironically, when we look at the layout of the cards, this is at the Eastern side of the cards in terms of the way in which the cards are laid out. And so here we have the devil card and the very next card after the devil card is the house of God. Funnily enough, and, and how sad that later it became known as the tower, but it's called the house of God in, in, in the original Marseille. And here's, here's the flaming sword at the Eastern gate. And it's basically saying before you can even enter the temple and, and enjoy and the, 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 the treasury of light within the temple, you, you first have to pass this test. <clears throat> So based on my research and, and my understanding, um, I call it the Abrahamic test. 
Hmm. And, and this is the whole idea that you have to be prepared to sacrifice your narrative, which is effectively your seven-year-old, hmm. in order for you to be able to enter and serve in the house of God. Abraham um, had a thing about, he, he, he was um, left the, the country of his, of his um, childhood because of an estrangement between him and his father and the king was going to kill Abraham and he had to leave. And so he had this damaged relationship with his father. And so when we start to look at all of the stuff that Abraham deals with, it's about parent-child stuff. He's got this hang up about having to have children. And so he takes Lot with him, that doesn't work out. He ends up giving birth to his wife's handmaiden and, and has Ishmael and, um, and, and, you know, God holds him out till he's 100 before he actually gives him his own child and eventually has Isaac and then he kicks out Ishmael and, and there's this ongoing thing and, and God eventually says, well, look, I don't know if you're really that committed to me because I think that your narrative around your deep wound is such that that's getting in the way of your capacity to serve me. I want you to go and sacrifice the one thing that, that sits at the core of your narrative. It's not Isaac he's asking him to sacrifice, it's his attachment to his narrative around being the abandoned child and, 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 his, and therefore his attachment to Isaac. Now we each have that, we each have a narrative that by the age of seven has been well and truly established in our programming. And, and so this becomes the thing that distracts our ability to really be present to agape and and in fact what happens is because of our programming our narrative gets caught up in wealth power love and fame and all the things that are all the absence of those things the scarcity mm -hmm. of those things and it's all being played out there and in fact the only way that we can make progress in there letting us know is that we have to be able to go through the process of relinquishing our attachment that's the ego of course, is, is mm -hmm. this whole idea of this narrative. And, and the beautiful thing about what we learn in, 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 in what they were teaching in these cards is that in fact, and I write about this in the book, is that our narrative and our story was the gift we gave ourselves to actually really learn how to turn up in the world with agape, with that level of love, you know, where you love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. And so, you know, in our narrative, we've all developed skills and abilities to survive our narrative. And those skills and abilities are the gifts that we can give to the planet to make a difference in the world, where previously we use them in order to satisfy the suffering that sat at the basis of our narrative. When we pass through the temple doors, we now use these to make a difference in the world and to serve humanity. And, and, and so, and that's how we resolve the ego. We don't, or the, the, the seven-year-old, we don't get rid of it. We, 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 we put it on a pedestal and we give it everything at once. And we say, you little ripper, look what you gave me because now <laughs> I can use these to make a difference in the world. And at that point, it's got everything it wants. You've got everything you want and you move on. And then we go um, into the temple. So right. those first four beatitudes are the dark night of the soul. Mm. So that's the journey through the dark night of the soul. And then once you pass through the test of the flaming sword and you enter the temple, then you enter the treasury of light. And so, um, and now you're dealing with blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. So now you're talking about enlightened consciousness and the way in which you turn up and, and serve the world. Um, the moon card um, is the Christmas card. The moon <laughs> card is the birth of Christ. Oh, this really? is the birth of Christ consciousness. It's really interesting. You know, this is one of the, the, the beautiful things that I found in my research is the, 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 the crustacean that's in the pond in the Marseille tarot is cancer, you know, astrologically. And these people believed in astrology as much as they did, particularly the Visconti, as much as they did in, in, in Christianity. And right in the centre of, of, of um, cancer is a constellation called the crib or the manger. And, and there's no, it, it's no coincidence that that's there because this is the point at which um, the Christ is now born. Um, it was conceived, by the way, way back in the temperance card where she's pouring water, which is new knowledge, 
her flower on her forehead is a red five little five petal rose the the white five petal rose represents the virgin the fact that it's now become red she's no longer the virgin she's conceived so that's the point at which christ consciousness is conceived and you go through then this this process of adopting new knowledge you go through the process of the works of mercy social justice helping those in need which we call the material works of mercy mercy then you go into the spiritual works of mercy pass the test of the flaming sword the spiritual works of mercy of forgiveness and and living a life centered in forgiveness which is the star card and now you come into the moon card and this is the point now you've done everything you can towards making this transformation and now that's the birth of christ and and entering into becoming a light to the world right wow uh, you mentioned oh go ahead jason sorry yeah i just well like i mean i think that um honestly uh, uh, J jonathan might even say this so i'm going to take the words right out of his mouth but like we could do a whole show just on that Abrahamic sacrifice of your personal narrative. Like, in fact, maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's let's, a, there's a future a, show right there. Let's put a pin in that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to flag, just like, all of that was fascinating, but that's a particular point that I'm like, really, I, yeah. So um, what I did when I first came across this knowledge and it really sort of unfolded for me um, I developed a, a, a personal mentoring program, and which is EAP Mentor, which is one of the links that you've shown there. And in that, we've actually created a mechanism. And it's a really simple, beautiful tool for people to help identify their narrative. Um, it, you see, you can't change what you can't see. And quantum physics says when something's observed, it changes. And so once people get their narrative, let me tell you, the stories of people's lives transforming to a place where they're able to create sustainable peace. And, 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 and of course, having the knowledge of the narrative and particularly the gifts of it, and this is where I call, you know, one of the questions you talk about later is Western mindfulness. Western mindfulness is the capacity to remember that when I'm out of my peace, I'm in my story and that, that I can, that I have a choice in this moment to be more loving to myself, to others and to the planet and not be dictated by my narrative. That's really the essence of Western mindfulness. And this is what it was that I believe the Cathars were in teaching that was intrinsic to, to their deep theology of love that was, that was um, hidden in these cards. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate just a little bit on the, the dark night of the soul. Is, is the dark night of the soul this process of the Abrahamic sacrifice and sort of the pain that's attached to it? Or, or can you talk a little bit about how you understand the dark night of the soul and, and why we have to go through it, why it can't just be sunshine and rainbows? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first card in the dark night of the soul is the hangman. And traditionally, he's seen hanging around a, a yajrail or a, or a frame that's made of trees that have all been pruned. Well, that, those three parts of timber that make up that framework have been pruned by justice, time and chance. So we've gone through this world where we have this attachment either through abundance or scarcity to wealth, power, love and fame. All of a sudden, justice, time and chance prune us of those things. And here we are left, but we're left hanging by a thread. So the hangman's upside down and his ankle is held by this one thread. And that one thread is our narrative. It's the thing that still keeps us attached to the world of illusion is the programming that that is still hidden and and so we go through this process of sitting in the awareness um, of and the grief of having been separated from those things and ultimately the handman the hangman is is in a place of grief now i i have a distinction between grief and mourning so the next card um, which is the the death card he changes and all of a sudden those things are no longer attached because they're now in the ground so in in the later cards in the in the 17th century cards in the 1600s we see the uh, uh, an emperor we see a victor we see a hand where the the the, the, the pope's fingers are sort of being in one hand and we see another sort of more softer hand there which represent wealth power love and fame we've now severed those things that the cords being cut and, um, and a big feature of the death card is the face 
of the figure looking back and and we've now become the witness of what was we're no longer attached to it we now become the observer of where we've been and of course in some cards even in, in early in the in that 1600s sometimes the death cards facing the other way looking forward and of course mourning in in the point at which we become the observer we're no longer attached to where we've been and now we're beginning to entertain the possibility of another reality while we're attached to those things that's not possible so blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted is really profound because there's comfort in being the witness there is no emotion in being the witness all you're doing is is observing in grief there's a lot of emotion and now you're ready to be taught and so you've emptied the cup and now here we have temperance pouring water into mm. the jug which is now the next one so we need people to walk us through those phases these are really it is a dark place mm. to get to that point where you start to let go but there's still one more letting go and that's of the narrative our programming and that's probably one of the most difficult. Um, and, and so essentially the Enhances Awareness Program, we actually guide people through that dark night of the soul journey and, and we, we bring them to the temple door. We don't take them into the temple. That's a whole different matter, but we certainly help people. And so you, you go through this process of taking on new knowledge. Um, then you hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is the, the fourth beatitude. Um, doesn't say blessed are those who are a little peckish. It's like this is <laughs> you take on a passion for social justice. You know, this is Jesus saying, you know, this is Jesus saying, when when I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. He's saying this is what you are now committed to. This is how you turn up in the world, and this is evidence of the fact that you're now beginning to align yourself with with Christ consciousness. Is that you're prepared to have a passion. To turn up and serve the world in this way let me tell you this is spirituality 101 this is only entry level mm -hmm. that we're talking about oh if we talk uh, you know you mentioned it and you mentioned you know western mindfulness uh is you know dealing with this abrahamic sacrifice and being able to look upon yourself in the world with love making that choice in the moment but can you talk a little bit about that like how you define mindfulness and what western mindfulness is by your definitions well, so my simple definition of Western mindfulness is remembering in each moment that you have a choice to be kinder to yourself, to others and to the planet. That's ultimately mindfulness from a Western perspective, is that love becomes the premise for how you um, engage life. Um, and, and, you know, having been around this work, I was first introduced to um, Course in Miracles and Attitudinal Healing. I mean, I look, um, throwing it all out, I was raised a Mormon and, um, and had a series of dreams um, at my first sat return around 29 when my father died. And he taught me about love in a language that I'd never heard of before. And uh, not, certainly not in the way that he was describing it. And at the end of these dreams, he said, is there anything you want to know? And I said, yeah, how does Mormonism fit into truth? And he said, I'll show you. It's easy for me to show you. And he took his hand and sort of drew an arc. And next thing there was this ball of light that was so brilliant that it made everything translucent. And he said, that's truth. And then he took his finger and drew a little circle. And I left an outline about, you know, the width of a palm's hand's reach. And he said, that's the, the Mormon church. It's just a tiny part of a much bigger truth. Um, go and find the bigger truth. And this is a man that had been my minister most of my life. And that was the beginning of me um, beginning to leave the church. And um, shortly after this, within a couple of months, um, my mother, um, bless her, gave me a book called Teach Only Love, written by Jerry Jampolsky. And uh, everything that was in this book was everything that had been in this dream. And that became my journey of the journey of seeking out the knowledge of love. What I found over the years was, and even in my own experience, I had knowledge, but I couldn't sustain the behaviour. I couldn't sustain forgiveness. I couldn't sustain kindness. And I had the desire for it and the intention for it, but the ability to sustain it kept on being undermined the whole time. And this is where the knowledge around that, that, that um, narrative. I have an acronym, which is CHASM. And basically, Western mindfulness is made up of two elements, and that is um, 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 awareness, and, and mindfulness and, and, uh, and awareness is a precursor. Um, mindfulness is about the fact that you have a choice 
choice to be loving or not. So in order to have a choice, you have to be aware. And so the process of awareness is four, of developing awareness is fourfold. The first is, what's my current reality? What's the truth of my current state of awareness right in this moment? You, once again, you can't change what you can't see. So this is a real, and I've developed a really gentle tool for people to be able to self-assess their current reality in terms of that. And the next one is, how did I get there? And that's about, um, which is H, which is about honouring or being self-honouring. And it's why am I less than self-honouring? And that's the narrative. And so we help people identify what the story is that has them in their suffering. The, um, the A is what's an alternate loving reality going to look like? So I have this reality brought about by this set of beliefs or programming what would a more loving reality look like? And so we begin to explore what it could look like if, if life was lived with a consciousness of, of love. And then the S, um, um, the S is, well, what would be the strategy? What would I have to do to get there? Now, here's where we differ. And, and I like to refer to our approach to mindfulness as pragmatic laziness. And that is all you've got to do is remember that you've got a choice and then follow the path of least resistance. And if the path of least resistance has you go back to doing what you did before, that's fine. As long as each time you're presented with the choice, you stop and remember that you have a choice, that, that there are strategies, that there is an alternate reality. And my experience shows that there's a tipping point in that where there's one point. And what you're doing is each time you practice remembering the self-loving alternative, you're building new neural pathways. And this is where we come into the modern science of neural pathway development. You're building new neural pathways. And in that, there's a tipping point where you go, no, today I choose to act more lovingly. And it's a natural loving choice. It's not a disciplined choice. If it's a disciplined choice, it won't work. Um, millions of failed diets prove that disciplined choices don't work. Um, this is about, it's got to be a loving choice. And the way that you do that is to become more aware. And then the practice of mindfulness is remembering that you have a choice and following the path of least resistance. Well, we're starting to get to the, the wrap up time, but uh, before we do the wrap up process, uh, Jason, do you have any final closing questions or comments or contributions? Uh, just to say that actually, like, again, there's, there were so many, um, there's so many, I think like, really big ideas and then lots of like amazing details around some of those big ideas that I'm just really, I have a lot of gratitude for having been present in this conversation. I don't think I had a lot of questions, but uh, um, I also think just what you said there about a loving choice versus a disciplined choice and how how true that is for just about everything, you know, like yeah. it's such a, it's a nugget that's true for what you're talking about, but it's also true for like just about everything that I can think of. So I'm really grateful to have heard that. Cool. Yeah. So, so Russell, if we can get in your plugs, I, I have been throwing up uh, some links uh, the, to your work. But of course, something that we haven't said yet is the actual name of your book. <laughs> <laughs> so the spiritual roots of the tarot, the Cathar Code hidden in the cards. Um, it's available worldwide now, or certainly um, in the English speaking world. And and uh, it was published by Inner Traditions and um, distributed by Simon and Schuster. So you should be able to, um, if your bookshop doesn't have it, they should be able to get it really easily. Um, and please, I, I obviously I'd love for people to go out and purchase it, but it's full of uh, amazing history um, of what was going on in medieval Europe. Um, and it's got some very, very deeply profound um, spiritual knowledge and understanding there that I think if you're on the spiritual path, I think you'll find very insightful. Mm. And uh, you have two websites um, that, that people can, if they want to work with you um, and go deeper into these topics. So Western Mindfulness is my personal one, um, where if people want to engage and encounter me one-on-one. Um, -on -one. I have also developed um, a business and, and a program called EAP Mentor. Um, and that's where people can um, um, discover other mentors who are helping people through the dark night of the soul journey it doesn't have to be me there's others that have been out there that have been trained to do that and if you're interested in learning how to um, become a modern day priest um, in, in helping to bring people to the temple door we also teach people um, how to become EAP mentors as well and they can go to that website and, and find out more about that 
I just want to say at this point, thank you so much for inviting me to um, be a part of your program and, and to be able to share um, this information. Um, as you can see, I'm a, a tad passionate about it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we're passionate about it too. And we're, we were really happy that uh, you were able to come on. And it's been, uh, you know, just fascinating. And uh, Taro's had a, had a bit of a resurgence, you know, over the last decade or so. So I'm really glad that there's all these uh, great books and resources about going deeper with Taro. Right. And here's, you know, here there's probably lots of people uh, listening and watching who are now going to come dig out their tarot decks and have a, a deeper relationship and uh, really, you know, delve into these 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 teachings. Um, uh, Jason, uh, do you have any plugs before we, we depart? Uh, not too much. Uh, I mean, like I run a theater company, but by the time people listen to this, I don't know. And considering that they're listening to it all over the world, <laughs> I don't know that they'll be able to uh, attend much of what we're doing. But we're all still doing a lot of distance stuff. Uh, so if you're interested, sagetheater.com, where you create all kinds of interesting uh, theater work there. And then myself, jasonmemmel.com, where some of my writing and, and other, uh, other projects might get, uh, get some air. So that's, that's about it for me. Perfect. And I have my usual plugs, which is talking about mindfulness. Um, I'm doing some uh, training in uh, mindfulness and meditation, uh, what's sometimes um, known as MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, the more uh, secular, uh, mainstream, uh, open forms of meditation. So uh, as sort of part of that process, I teach meditation. I, we do a Sunday sit every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Montreal time. It's, uh, it's not specifically Gnostic. It's not specifically any religion. It's not actually a religious practice in, in this particular context. So it's particularly open to anyone. There's no charge. Feel free to come anytime. It's great for both uh, beginners and for people who uh, want to go deeper with their practice. It's an hour sit divided up into a few different practices, some silent, some guided. That's mylandmeditation.substack.com. And if you're hungry for that gnosis and you want to hang out with some Gnostics, well, I have my parish in Montreal. We meet every two weeks uh, the, on the second Sunday. Uh, right now, for the crisis, we are doing it online. It's not going to stay online, unlike the, the meditation that I just threw up there. So if, if you ever want to, you know, come and hang out, uh, check us out. It's holygrail.substack.com. That is more of a meditation night, though, particularly online. You in person, perhaps we will do uh, celebrate the mass, but uh, online, you know, spiritual meditation with uh, discussion afterwards. And yeah, so that's that's it for me. That's it for this episode. Thanks everybody so much for watching and listening. And this is Deacon Jonathan Stewart signing off. Bye everyone. <laughs> <laughs>